it's touted as able to cure everything but death, which seems very dramatic, but it does have so many wide varying benefits. Today, we're talking about a few top superfoods that you've identified that can radically help people up-level their health if they work for them. But a lot of these work for a lot of people. And we're right. going to get to that in a second. Right. And I want to jump right in by talking about the first one because it's something that you're very excited about. Yes. And that's black cumin seed. Why is that one of your first and number one superfoods on this list that I have right here in front of me? So it's a really, really powerful anti-inflammatory. But before that, it's something that has been part of my rotation since I was a child. It's very prevalent in Egypt. Um, it's sourced from Egypt. And so we've always had it in oil form or seed form um, from a culinary perspective, but also sort of helps you not get sick, which was this, the simplest way my parents would describe it. And so you just listen to your parents. And then fast forward to what it is I do now, I started to research it more to understand it, to incorporate it with my clients. And I found that it has really powerful antiviral, antibacterial properties and is really, really great for performance when it comes to athletes, which is what I do specifically. So it's something that I always used and it seems to reduce inflammation at rapid pace for my athletes post-play. And I wanted to understand more research that might be out there on it because it's starting to become more popular. And so I started to find research around people replacing their um, arthritis medication with it, for example, or it helping with candida overgrowth. And it's, it's touted as able to cure everything but death, which seems very dramatic, but it does have so many wide varying benefits. And then taking it one step further, we had, you know, something happened over the class course of the few years here. And I was noticing that very few of my clients and athletes were getting sick and then looking into more research and finding its ability to reduce viral loads. Um, and so all of that put together made me make it in, um, like a most valuable player ingredient. And so my clients will take a tablespoon of the oil a day um, or we'll still use it from a C perspective. But there's a particular compound in there, which I'm going to butcher, called thiaquinone. And that's the active compound that seems to have so many incredible benefits. And the research, there's a lot of research that exists on it, but there's now more focus. So I'm excited to see additional research. And, and when I say studies on it, it's also double blind studies, which is like, yes. So it's something that I just used because my parents told me to. <laughs> and then doing what I do professionally now, being like, okay, this is really interesting. There's more to this than just like mom said. I got a couple questions about how your parents used it. But first, my science writer on my team, her name is Taylor, uh, nutritionist and science writer. She was the first person that really sort of highlighted to me, you know, during the pandemic and everything, when people were having a hard time getting back their smell, right. that there was a protocol with black cumin seed right. that a lot of people were using right. to address sort of the inflammation, it seemed that people were losing their smell long-term because yep. the inflammation could not break that cycle and was affecting certain cells that control the, yep. can control everything with smell. And, um, and, and shout out again to Taylor because she gave that sort of protocol to a few people and said, try it. And it worked for a bunch of people. Yeah. I had a client's friend who came in and had not had his sense of smell for a year. And he's someone that's somewhat skeptical around nutrition. And I was like, just try this for three weeks. Let me know what happens. I did a tablespoon three times a day uh, for him, a black seed oil, and then two tablespoons of ashwagandha a day. And uh, within 10 days, <laughs> I was in the other room and he was eating and he goes, holy shit. <laughs> he's like, I can taste the cinnamon. And he's like, okay, Mary, I think you're onto something. And I'm like, you think I'm onto something? It's my first day. <laughs> you think I'm onto something? So that was it. Was really cool to see that. Um, and there's yeah, there's definitely something to black cumin seed that's really fascinating. So much so that I'm formulating a supplement with some of the uh, scientists that work with Thorn um, to put together a compound where the star ingredient is black cumin seed. So when you give it to the athletes that you work with today, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and how you work with them. What's the let's say if it's for maintenance and just helping them stay in a good place with their immune system, et cetera, yep. all the benefits that you mentioned. 
how much are you giving to, to them and what sort of form and are you sourcing it from anything in particular that our community could benefit from until your supplement arrives sure. one day in the future? Sure. Uh, tablespoon a day for maintenance. Um, post game, uh, we'll do a couple of days of two tablespoons a day. And then if they are sick with something, the protocol shifts and that is uh, client dependent. So I won't throw out anything around that. And it's it's an oil. Um, I use Zatik. Uh, they source from a single farm in Egypt. Um, incredible founders of that company. That's actually who I'll be sourcing from for my so supplement as, as well. A, what was the name of the company? Zatik. Zatik. Z- yes. Z-A-T-I-C. T-I-K. Pardon me. Um, and I will, from a culinary perspective, use uh, seeds when I'm fermenting foods, um, which it adds flavor. It's very peppery. I will say if you try the oil, it's the worst thing you'll ever taste in your yeah, life. Yeah, I've tasted it before. It's intense. <laughs> I, I tell everyone this is the worst thing you'll ever have. I've become accustomed to it. They have capsules if you don't want to take down the oil. Um, there's also some benefits uh, shown with mixing it with honey. So it's not just a spoon for, full of sugar helps the medicine go down. It Actually, there is a chemical response that they've been showed specific to COVID actually with uh, the honey and the black seed oil, but that will make it easier to take down. Yeah. And even if you're not dealing with right now, it could be something that people can incorporate into their routine, just like a maintenance thing. The number of uh, athletes that come across and retired athletes who uh, they're definitely put off by the taste for sure in the beginning, but they stick with it. And within a few days- They'll say, like, I've had some of the greatest of all time be like, I need more of this black seed oil because I feel incredible, the pain in my joints. And these are athletes who are on some next level of wear and tear on their body. And they notice the effects of, I feel so much better on this. So it, it is something where if you can tolerate it and you're not one of the very, very few people who can't handle it, a non-negotiable when it comes to my clients. So we have a whole list here that we're going to get to in a second, and then we're going to do a little background on you so our audience understands where you're coming from and your experience and what you're up to these days. Before we get into that, there is a sense is that you know everything we're going to be talking about today, like it's going to make people excited. And then even separate from this, you do a lot of ingredient spotlights on Instagram. I talk about a lot of stuff. You and I both personally come across a lot of things that are just seems exciting. Mm-hmm. How do you, on a most simplistic level, when people ask, when you're thinking about putting together what you take, what you take a break from, right. how you incorporate into your schedule, you can't do everything. Right. So how do you approach that? Approach specifically when I'm telling a client or like the Both the with audience? a client or for yourself. So I I always start with actual tests. So you do blood testing, uh, gut testing. If you're an athlete, we'll do sweat and spit analysis because I do want to know what is actually happening to your body. I do say, you know, uh, superfood for one person could be kryptonite for another person. So always understanding what's going on under the hood. And these are tests that are covered by insurance. So it's not necessarily like something that you have to shell out of money for. And um And from there, we can get an idea of things we want to focus on. If someone doesn't want to start with that, it's – I tell people if you're approaching this for the first time, look up an ingredient. Look up the benefits of an ingredient from a culinary perspective. Now, take it one step further and look up what's a minimal effective dose required for you to see a difference in your body. And what's the minimal effective prescription of cadence you should be taking it and try that for a period of time. Um, And – I do that with caffeine a lot. You know, caffeine has pros and cons, and I really like to lean on the minimal effective dose to to see how that's going to help me perform. So there's different ways to approach it, whether you want to do it through actual blood testing and seeing what you need or just getting a basic understanding. And this information is available on the internet um, and through different studies that you can easily access. I do distill them in the, the highlights I do on my Instagram, but I always say, I want you guys to dive deeper because it, if for example, you're on a medication and turmeric might interact with that, that's something that is so individual that you do need to take it a step further. So it's always a jumping off point. Now for my clients, we get very detailed. I start with a gut reset, which is a fasting mimicking protocol and an elimination diet, and then start to introduce things. And we're documenting every day. And I feel like that sounds intense to your average person, but to your average person, I really feel like you should treat your body like you are an athlete. But performance nutrition is for everyone. Everyone's performing on some level in their day-to-day lives. So 
I don't know how to get people excited about spending more time doing this. Maybe you have figured out the way to get them excited. Um, but it's not always going to be super simple when you want to get the most out of specific ingredients. There's a difference between eating healthy or healthier than you were before and then really utilizing the specific benefits of specific ingredients. Which, of course, that already is a huge step for most of the world's population, eating healthier than you were before. So anybody who's overwhelmed, like take it step by step. Yeah. And again, pick and choose what you decide to move forward with. It's like anything in life. Something gets you excited. You resonate with something. There's probably some sort of vibrational frequency or right, something right, going right. on where it's like, huh, that's interesting. Let me look into it. Right. You, you mentioned something earlier that I think is just we should tease it out a little bit. You said somebody's superfood could be somebody else's. I don't know if you use the word poison, but kryptonite. Kryptonite. Superheroes. <laughs> Tease that out a little bit. And what are some common examples of things that are out there in the sphere of the world that even for some of the top athletes that you work with or yourself as an example, maybe it is beneficial for somebody else, but it's not as beneficial for sure. somebody else. Like what's an example of that? Don't yell, everyone. Coffee is a perfect example of that. Coffee for some people is incredible. Coffee for some people creates an autoimmune response and uh, anxiety and more aggressive behavior and inflammation. And it could be the dose someone's taking or it could be coffee in general. Like I'm very sensitive to coffee. I can handle other types of caffeine, but coffee I can't. And I didn't need a test to tell me that, but later on I found out that I have a gene mutation where coffee is terrible for me. Um, turmeric in, in higher doses is terrible for me. Uh, and again, that's through testing. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I ingredients or a lot of sports foods and drinks right now that have beets in it, but beets could be a high inflammatory food for some people. So I'll utilize turnips for those athletes. Um, it could really be almost any ingredient that that everything you eat has a pro or a con. There's no benign food. So it's very much a sort of drilling down and listening to your body, which again can be overwhelming and it takes time to identify those. Yeah. It takes time. And I think a lot of functional doctors would say that just because something doesn't work for you right now may not be a sign that that thing is bad. Right. Like in general, right. you might need to do something like a gut reset right. or get to the root of it, right. patch things up, deal with the leaky gut or whatever's going on. And then all of a sudden something starts to work again. So Things take time, but like outline the gut reset. And is that something that our audience can do? Can they yeah. follow along? So sort of piggybacking what you said, I always say what works for me may not work for you. And what works today may not work in six months. So I love that. And I really feel for functional medicine doctors because a lot of people go to any doctor looking for an answer right away. And when it comes to gut health and wellness, it it takes time to figure out what works. And then it takes an understanding that's going to shift over time. So I feel for them because sometimes they're like, but you said, but you said, and it's like, it takes time. You have to be patient with it. Um, and I, I, again, really feel for them because it can be frustrating for both ends, but it can also be really a f fun. I mean, my idea of fun is different than other people's fun discovery period. So my gut reset, the reason why I do that with clients on the front end is before I run any labs, I want to know what their baseline is like without all the normal inflammatory foods that they have been eating. So I released uh, an online version of it, I think one a year and a half ago. And it was the first time I ever released anything that I've done with my clients in that format. So the beginning of it is three days of a very specific bone broth. It's one of my recipes incorporates a lot of different ingredients I grew up with that has different benefits. And you're just having that bone broth for the first three days and some olive oil. So that's the fasting mimicking portion of it, broth fasting. And then the next four days after you've done those first three days are the same nutrient dense foods that repeat themselves breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's still a calorie restriction. So it's a week that I recommend that, that people take it easy. I do have one athlete. She is a goat. She decided she was going to go full on boxing during it. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but she's in a league of her own and it definitely helped her in those ways. But it is something that I want people to take it easy with. And through that whole week, I'm having my clients document everything they're experiencing because it's information. There's going to be some things that make you feel great about the reset and there's going to be some things you don't feel good about. And it's all information. So if you get a particular rash on a part of your body, that's information. If you have a headache on the first day 
versus a headache on the fourth day, that's information. If you don't respond well to the fiber and the shiitake mushrooms, that's information. So from that week, we then go to a functional medicine doctor because I work with a team of people who are much smarter than me. And we go, this is what they experienced during this gut reset. Let's run these labs. And what are the best guesses we can make with their diet moving forward until we get those results back? And it's it's really cool some of the feedback I've gotten from readers who have done it, um, as well as some doctor's office are replacing more popular um, resets right now with this protocol. And I think they really love it because it focuses on whole foods. Um, and so the way I launched it, it, for my clients, we make modifications and we revisit it a couple of times of the year. But for um, for the general population, I give a format that allows them to document all of those things themselves and then take it to a functional medicine doctor who most of them are like, I know exactly what the goal of this was. And this is amazing information for us to then to proceed. Yeah. As somebody who's a partner in a medical clinic, the other thing that I love about this is that often when you go to a functional medicine doctor and the context that you shared earlier is so helpful is like, they're trying their best. I'm sure there's just like in any practice or any sort of profession, there's always good ones and there's ones that are not that great. So you got to ask around, really sort of do your homework. But additionally, the one thing that I hear constantly, and many of them have been on this podcast, is that the population set is just way sicker than before. Like mm -hmm. people are coming in with so many more things going on than ever before. So the more that you can do a little bit of work on your end mm -hmm. and doing something like this gut reset is putting in that work, you're coming in and what you would have paid for in your first appointment for them right. to just tell you to go do this thing, right. you're already having done it. And sure, maybe you didn't have any labs done up until this time, but you're coming in with feedback and information to them that's going to help them narrow in. And no doctor would know that on your first appointment without that information that's right. being shared there. So right. it's a great way to, if you are one of the few that can afford you know, working with a, a practitioner um, this is a good approach to help you sort of get the best bang out of your buck. And it is removing any of that frivolous noise in your body. So if somebody comes to me day one and they're like, okay, I want to run labs, but they had chips and some fast food the day before, your labs are going to definitely be skewed towards the inflammation that you're experiencing from the diet you've had for the first few days. But if you're, and this is my perspective, I'm not saying it's the right perspective. It's been effective in the last 10 years of what I've been doing, um, but it could still be anecdotal. But if you run through the reset first and then we run the labs, I have an idea of what your true inflammation is independent of what you ate the last few days. And that's the information I'm looking for. I don't want, I, I don't know if it's right to call it a dirty lab, but I don't want a dirty lab. I want a lab that had that ahead of ahead of us running that because it'll it'll just help me figure out what program I'm gonna put together for my clients. Cause it's not just it supplements, it's ingredients, it's meal timing, it's the the macros, all of it. And all of that helps me determine that. And for people that won't be working with a doctor or maybe don't have access to somebody who's like a you know functional medicine, naturopathic doctor, integrative, um, they can still get benefit from this. And are there any guides to, you know, there's a lot of self lab testing companies or like, you know, should they try to convince their current doctor or try to work within the insurance system? I'm right. sure you get this question all the time. What do you say? What do you suggest? If, you, if you're not going to see or can't see a doctor, this is still a great jumping off point to then approach a paleo diet or a whole 30. It's it's a prep before you jump into a program that's going to change your diet altogether because it'll allow you to very clearly almost very clearly see how you respond to the foods you're reintroducing. So if someone does the reset and they're like I feel really good, what do I do next? There's a there's a model meal program at the end of it that I included as a bonus, but it's like okay, now now go into just eating healthier proteins vegetables, but introduce them in groupings so you can really see how you're responding to the food. And that could be enough to really change your life. And you may not even need to worry about um, any persistent symptoms because they may go away, but just it'll it'll help you become your own advocate in a lot of, of those ways. And so that that seems to, again, the the feedback I get from people is really impressive. I never tout like this is like the holy grail, but people are coming back with um, my Crohn's flare up is gone. I've had uh, persistent symptoms related to a traumatic brain injury, and that seems to dissipate. Um, the bloat that I've always had is gone. The headaches are gone. My vision is clear. And 
I I know inflammation is this like word we use frivolously now. There's a comedian that made a whole shtick on. Did you see it? No. Where he was like, have you been taking turmeric? And he's like, turmeric? He's like, yeah, turmeric. He's like, the thing that I buy once to make a dish and it stains all of my pots and pans. He's like, yeah. He's like, why would I take that? He goes, inflammation. He's like, what's that? He's like, you know, general inflammation. He's like, what's that? He's like, that's the new bad thing. He's like, I thought cholesterol was bad. He's like, no, turns out that's good. <laughs> Inflammation's the thing. So I love that. That shtick. Welcome to nutrition. <laughs> yeah. Um, really cracks me up. But it, I think there's a root of this inflammatory response that's causing all of these other things that people are experiencing. Or if you have something like a traumatic brain injury, the response to that. So um, I have a little highlight thing on my Instagram of people saying what they've experienced. So we run that play before we start working together if someone's going to make changes. But for my clients and myself, we'll, we'll revisit the gut reset, maybe not all seven days, sometimes modified after long bouts of travel. If they fell off our programming related to what we're doing from a diet perspective, if they're feeling under the weather, we can run it for a couple of days or run through the whole seven again, or maybe modify it where we'll do the dense foods all seven days. So there's different ways to make it work for you. I put it out and like this is the most general way to do it, but you can definitely make it your own. The, the whole thing is paleo, you, like make it your own. Love it. So before we go into the next superfood, and we have four more that we're going to cover here, let's give a little bit of a background context. So classic sort of question, Mary, what do you do? Yeah. There's a lot of layers to it. Give the audience the layers. I, I am a performance chef and specialist. i came to become this performance chef and specialist known as paleo chef from being sick most of my life. It's a common story in our industry, not knowing what's wrong, being in the ER at least once a month, passing out in vomit from a migraine and doctors being that young, they assume you're on drugs and they're like, what did you take? What did you take? And you're trying to explain to them that you just have this mystery illness no one can figure out. And it started in second grade for me. And by the time I hit fourth or fifth grade, I decided like, oh, this is just my normal. So I made peace with it and just lived in pain every single day and did my best to not let it affect my livelihood. So if I was at a birthday party with a headache coming on, I'd be like, no, I'm going to stay until the very last minute or playing sports. I had coaches that understood I would have limited eyesight if I have a migraine that day, hives, and we would find ways for me to still play the sports I want to play uh, around that. And the hospital visits became more frequent as I got older. And there was when I was 23 or 24, the final hospital visit where I was just so frustrated with misdiagnosis, medications that didn't make any sense, nothing that was really helping. And me asking, you know, what what is the root, what is causing the migraine and had a sort of a meltdown in the hospital, ripping out the IV, marching out, like, I'm going to figure this out on my own. And uh, it... It was surprising that it took that long because mm. I'm very clearly very assertive in other parts of my life, but was just relying on doctors to tell me what they thought was wrong versus doing that research. So stumbled upon a TED talk by Dr. Terry Walls. We all love Dr. Terry Walls on mind, minding your mitochondria. Remembering I did a whole report on the mitochondria in high school where my lab partner and I rewrote the words to a Beastie Boy song about ATP. Got to fight for your right to ATP <laughs> and being like, oh, all of this sort of made sense and was leading up to it. A technical paper I wrote in seventh grade about my idea of what autoimmune really means and then sending out my own lab work. So all that research happening at the same time and assuming I'm going to be sensitive to gluten in some way. So I started to remove gluten right off the bat. Test came back that I actually have celiac disease. And I was like, okay, this is more serious. I was stoked when I got that. I was like, amazing. I just stop eating this and I feel better. Like I didn't feel limited by, oh, what am I going to eat? Fruit, vegetables, proteins. I can still have scotch. Amazing. We're good. <laughs> and so I, within a few months of changing my diet, all those symptoms went away. And I was in corporate technology and uh, my colleagues were noticing, you know, you don't seem like you're in pain anymore. You're not sitting at your desk with sunglasses on. And I was always an overachiever because I'm actually a high school dropout and I went into tech at a really young age. So my peers are 10 and 15 years my senior. So I have to not just make quota, exceed quota to make sure that there's no reason to be like, let the young gun go. So them noticing, um, you know, you're not having to muster through the day anymore. 
to prove something, like you seem better. And I'm like, I am. It's the diet that I'm changing. And at the time, paleo is becoming a popular word. And so it was so much easier to say I'm following a paleo diet versus, oh, I'm avoiding gluten, casein, and soy. And uh, somebody asked me in in that environment, oh, would you put together a plan like this for me? And I was like, I could. Like, will you cook for me? And I'm like, I don't cook for people. I manage multi-million dollar contracts, like being just so full of myself. And uh, he's like, you know, I'm willing to pay somebody this amount of money. And I was like, well, this is amazing. I live in San Francisco. You can make good money and still be poor. Heck yeah, I'll do this as a side hustle. It'll pay for my designer dresses, all those things. And so that was my first client. My second client, uh, which came about a couple of weeks later, I was getting my wisdom teeth removed because they were coiled and impacted and all the stuff I had to get put under for it. And when I came to, the the uh, surgeon was like, oh, I'm so excited that you're going to be my private chef. So under the influence I've already subconsciously decided I'm a private chef mm. and pitched myself as a private performance chef. So those are my first two clients and was trying to do both um, for a little period of time, just a few months. And my body was tired, breaking down very much like you can't do both. This is too much on you. So I had to choose one or the other. I had a serendipitous moment with a famous chef at the Ferry Building and that inter- interaction, which my friend had to point out to me because I was so in my head about what it is I wanted to do next, I quit the next day corporate and went all in on personalpaleochef.com. And then fast forward another month, um, Kamal Ravikant, a friend of mine, made a comment about why I don't have paleochef.com. And I'm like, oh, it's being taken. Somebody's using it. He's like, really? You should check it right now. I'm like, I told you, dude, it's used. Someone's using it. He's like, let's just check. It was going to auction that day. <laughs> Had he not said that, I wouldn't have been able to win paleochef.com at auction. So I'm running that play. I'm By the way, only- Kamal's been on this podcast before. Oh, amazing. He's a great guy. Amazing. Um, I am sort of just like following the signs and and my friend Mark Grove says, you know, it sounds like you're responding to the call. Although that's not what I'm aware that I'm doing. I'm just sort of going with what makes sense. I've ever been very much like uncertainty is the greatest opportunity um, in life. And so that's sort of the call that I was following. And um, I was the only one that was doing what I was doing at the time. So when any athlete, any tech titan, any actor was Googling personal paleo chef, I was the only one showing up. So it was a combination of luck, timing, opportunity. But the reason why I'm still doing it 10 years later is follow through. So I got those clients early on because I was the only one doing it at the time, but I have the credibility I do because of how detailed I am. That, that it's I'm still learning how to say this, but the talent that I possess to be able to still be doing that 10 years later. So that's how it started. That's how I got these incredible athletes over the last decade. I've been able to work with some of the greatest athletes in the world. Um, I get to say now I have a championship under my belt. Go for it. I worked with a couple of players there. Um, And I mean, just some of the most incredible humans in the world um, that buy into and trust me with their health in this way. Beautiful. And in addition to the personal paleo work that you do with individual clients and athletes, you're also an entrepreneur. Let's just do a high level. We'll chat more about fat, fat fudge and all the other stuff you're up to, but just explain a little bit about what led to the products that you created. It's it's stress testing it. So you see things that work really well with your clients and you're like, this is really interesting. You share about it. And again, responding to the call, fat fudge is a great example of that. It's something I made for my clients because I don't love protein bars and I don't like goo packets and I needed something different for them. So I was making them fat fudge. I called it functional fudge at the time. And they're hitting PRs on the field, on the court. The musicians are like, wow, I had a great writing session today. And so I shared that recipe. That recipe went viral. And then people were taking pictures of that product in little baggies. I'd be like, you've got to turn this into a product. So I took $600 and went on Periscope RIP and was like, okay, there's 50 orders available online and I don't know what I'm doing, but if you buy them, I will figure out how to make into a product. And it sold out in an hour. And it it wasn't that it sold out in an hour that was interesting. It was more so uh, who bought it, who I didn't realize was following my work. And I was like, okay, don't fuck up now. 
these people are watching you. And um, and so just repeated that process and all future products that come out underneath the Fat Fudge house, it has to do with products that have been stress tested with performance athletes. This is not me sending an idea into a lab or asking formulators to make me a recipe. This is stuff that I've created on my own and have used with my athletes and my clients and being like, there's actually legs behind this and feeling so confident with putting it on the market because of that. Yeah. Tastes amazing. You brought a bunch over here. I've ha- I've tried it for years. It's been in all the Air Ones and stores yeah. and all this stuff around here. Air One was my first, my first store when I was still hand packing it. That's amazing. Yeah. My and and just so everybody's clear, we're talking about P-H-A-T. Yes. Fat Fudge. Yes. And uh, link in the show notes. We'll chat more about it in a second. Okay. We're going to pivot from your story and I'm sure we're going to come back to it in a second. We're going to go into the next superfood. You know, you mentioned Terry Walls. She's mm-hmm. been on this podcast twice. Love Terry. And something interesting for anybody that knows the Walls Protocol, which is something that she developed for people that primarily have autoimmune and she had MS, is that she was she grew up vegetarian. And then as she started to understand that sometimes a diet that you think is going to be the best for you is not going to do the best for your health. And she had these autoimmune symptoms and progressive MS. And she created this version of like her version of like the paleo autoimmune diet. And felt like people would get better, but they weren't getting fully better. And she came on this podcast. She said there was two things she did and modified the diet that immediately it started working for a lot more people. The first one was working their way slowly up over a period of time up to getting about eight to nine cups of vegetables a day. That was one. Number two, which is what we're going to talk about next, is inclusion of organ meats. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about why Organ meats, in particular, liver, Mm -hmm. is number two on your list of top superfoods. Goes back culturally. I've been eating liver since I was a child. It's one of my favorite foods, dishes that my mom would make it. it. Yeah, how do they make it? Well, that's where I got tripped up was um, none of my friends growing up grew up in California liked liver. And I'm like, liver's amazing. What are you talking about? And then I went to a friend's house for dinner and her mom made liver and it was liver and onions and it was gray and it was bland. And I'm like, okay. Now I understand why you don't like liver. Um, in Egypt, we make it with coriander and cumin and cinnamon and green peppers and jalapeno, and it just full. It's like feels so warm when you eat it. Um, and again, just part of our diet since we're kids. And lo and behold, parents are right. It is something that is super nutrient dense. The I don't have all the recommended daily values memorized, but. It's in my ebook and I post about it all the time. They're like thousand percent of all these different necessary um, nutrients. And when I incorporate it in now, there are some people who have too much iron and definitely should avoid liver. This is not for those because, again, not everything is going to be great for everyone. But um, we did uh, a project with Nike, the female running team. So these are, are women who are um, expending tons of calories Um, Some of them are bought into vegetarian, vegan lifestyle. And even though they are performing well, they have so many health issues. One's losing their hair. The other one hasn't had their period in a period of time. The other one can't put on weight. And I I don't like to throw everything at someone right away, particularly for females. uh, My first recommendation is usually let's incorporate liver, either eating it or capsules. It was insane, this project we did, Nike, within a few weeks period returns for one. The other one is able to put on weight. The other one is like, I, I, I'm i experiencing like a warmth in my body. And then after, for her, after like 10 weeks, she was experiencing new growth of hair, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, energy depletion across all clients usually goes up. And so that's, it's something that again is liver is so normal in other cultures and for whatever reason is not here, but it is a, another non-negotiable, non-negotiable should your test not show that we should be avoiding organ meat? Now, today, when you make it, what are some of your favorite recipes? And are any of them available online? If people bang in liver, bang in liver. <laughs> yeah. All right, talk about it. What yeah. is it? How do you make it? Um, it's the way I described. So it's okay. exactly the way we make it in Egypt. The way I had it growing up. I have had it on pop up menus for my my um, collaborations with different chefs. And you're like you're putting liver on a menu in LA and. Nobody returned it. Every and some people were skeptical and they loved it. I've maybe had one person in the last ten years across not just clients or uh, patrons of the pop ups or even people who bought 
the ebook and did it, one person is like, ah, I just can't get past the texture. Everyone else is like, I can't believe I love liver. Now, I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong at some point, be like, I hate it, can't get past it. But I, I think most foods that you don't like has to do, this is where the culinary side comes in, has to do with the preparation totally. that goes into it. Um, some people who don't love chewing on liver will uh, make it the way that uh, my recipe calls for and then blend it into a cream and like do pate with it, just full of so much flavor. I can say that that is, as, as somebody who grew up vegetarian and never really had liver, never had anything, and then when I got into the world of functional medicine and connecting with all these great doctors and seeing that, okay, this diet that I thought worked really well for me anymore doesn't feel like it's working well. When I first had liver, it was in the form of a pate. Mm -hmm. And it was actually at a restaurant just right down the street from over here where we're at in uh, Los Angeles. And it's called Farm Shop. They have a chicken liver mousse yeah, yeah. on the menu. And it's uh, a little bit of liver blended with some like some fruits and other stuff. And it's this beautiful pate that you can add to like a cracker or yep. just eat with veggie sticks. And uh, that was like a great introduction because yeah. <laughs> it made me <laughs> more safe. excited yeah. <laughs> to to actually try it out in other forms. Yeah. If you had liver and onions first get, you'd be like hard pass. Yeah. I feel for all the kids who are scarred for life on the liver and onions. Yeah. I deal with that a lot. They, they're some sort of like really visceral childhood response to it. So I'll hide it. I'll make tacos or something. In the spectrum of organ meats as a whole, is there any particular reason that you particularly put the spotlight on liver compared to some of the other organs that are there in organ meats? It, it The spotlight was there in the beginning, truthfully, just because it's something that was incorporated in my Your culture. Background. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, you find out and when you do the research, it is something that is very nutrient dense. I also think it's more palatable. Um, like we, I grew up eating hearts and tripe and all of that, but that those are harder to really get behind if you're not used to that texture. Even I'm like, I don't feel like eating hard today. It's a little too much work. <laughs> do you have to? Do you ever uh, have to be an advocate for something like liver from people who are from your cultural background and have forgotten about it? Like anybody in your family that you said, guys, liver was a part of how we grew up, and I'm going to get you re-excited about it again. Or no? No, we're excited about it. When I go home to Egypt. Um, you know, you, you come over for one dinner, but your auntie is going to make food for a week for that one table because they totally. want all your favorites. The 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 thing of liver is huge because we all love it. Um, yeah, it's no one needs to get excited about liver in my culture. So a couple more clarifying questions for people, because even a lot of people who are listening to this podcast maybe haven't dived into liver. So what form of liver are you using? And do you use any particular services to ensure like quality or you have like a butcher or something that you go to to get the, the best quality? Um, I would recommend uh, checking out your local farmer's market, getting to know your your butcher that's there and understanding where it's coming from. Um, chicken liver, I lean towards because again, it's the way I ate it growing up. I think it's a little more palatable. The texture is a little better. You can go beef or chicken, whatever your preference is. Um, beef is, I think easier to mess up in the cooking process. So this is the culinary side. If you overcook it, um, it will become very tough and rubbery. Chicken liver, you can overcook it a little, little bit. There's a margin for error there. Um, but yeah, the head, hitting up your local butcher is what, or your farmer's market and find out the local farm that is um, servicing that area is usually what I recommend. And uh, any capsule recommendations, companies you like? Um, Paleo Valley, really like them. Um, and then there's another one. Organ I, Complex, I think it's named. The Organ Complex, Organ yeah. Complex, it's yeah. got a, it's got a few other things in there that are really great for you. Um, and then I there's I can't remember the name now, but there's one out of New Zealand, I believe, that I really did like. I was looking at at um, other some some of the other countries have better regulations around their farming practices. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, let's go into the next one. And you actually also have a product that has this superfood ingredient that I just tried. It's fantastic. And that next one is tahini. So just explain to people what is tahini. A lot of people actually surprisingly don't know what it is. And why is it on your top five list? Tahini is ground sesame seeds. Um, it has uh, a really beautiful nutty flavoring to it. So could almost be like peanut butter almost i don't have peanut butter i haven't had peanut butter in like 11 years so to me it tastes like peanut butter because i don't remember what peanut butter tastes like but tahini is 
everything in the Middle East. I don't know if it's everything in your culture too, because you do have halva, is what you guys call it. We call it halawa in mine. It's not everything, but it definitely, we have that Middle Eastern influence in some of the yeah. ingredients, often in desserts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's used a little bit sparingly in our Indian culture. So in, in the Middle East and in, in, uh, Mediterranean culture, we use it for sweet and savory foods. So you hummus has tahini in it. Um, and our desserts have it, our ice creams have it, uh, we'll make dressings with it, different dips with it. Um, so it's just something again, that's always been in the fridge. I consider it a staple and then doing what I do now, I'm like, oh, this is actually a really great vehicle, uh, when it comes to nutrient density, the way it's absorbed in the system, um, for intake is really interesting too. Has a really great profile of magnesium, potassium, manganese, a little bit of iron. Um, and it was the fat fudge is inspired by halawa or halva, which is a dessert. And I was eating it one day and thinking about how, oh, the ingredients are so clean. And then there's a different story of me doing some uh, formulation for the Oracle sailing team and wasn't really happy with one of the final things I was trying to do for those athletes. And as I'm holding the halawa in my hand, thinking like, wait, if you modify these things, it can become a performance food. Separate from that, because original cacao is the first one, the spice ingredient in there was a combination of spices I was using for a coffee that I had posted. And I jokingly called it unicorn fuel. Be careful what you say on the internet because they ran with it and it was vo voted like number two coffee hack of that particular year because the recipe went viral. Um, so I had a canister of unicorn dust <laughs> on my counter, which was the pre-measured stuff just to easily make the coffees that I was doing for my clients. And so when I was making the halawa for myself, um, it's very temperamental. And uh, I... I uh, missed the timing of it. So I knew it wasn't going to crystallize like a natural tahini or natural halva. And so I dumped in all those ingredients of the unicorn dust in there and ended up making this OG formula for, for fat fudge. And the other ingredients are like maca and turmeric. Um, the original one had some cayenne in there. And the ability for those other things to get absorbed better in combination with the tahini made it really interesting and powerful. Like for example, um, coffee is in original, the equivalent of one coffee bean per packet, which is like 10 milligrams, not very much. Some of my friends are like, oh my God, how much caffeine is in this? I feel so focused and like so, like so much energy. And I'm like, interestingly enough, not very much, but the combination of that minimal effective dose with the maca, with the different elements of tahini has enabled you to be more focused. And so I, I really enjoy people who are skeptical and think it's just like a snack and they take it and they're like, I'm noticing that I'm like locked in or I hit a PR on the field, like I had more energy to keep going. So oh, tahini. Tahini. So it's like, a, it's like a transportation vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like a great way. So separate from that, is there any other ways that you recommend that people incorporate tahini? Like the most common one that people use is probably like dressings. Is there other ways that you would incorporate into your recipes so people can get the benefits? Um, I mean, yeah, from a culinary perspective, I'm making dressings with it. I'm making dips with it. Um, I'm making some healthier desserts with it. Sometimes I'm just spooning it or eating it with some fruit, um, putting it into a smoothie. There's, It's so vers versatile. Like it, it, I don't know what the Middle East is without tahini, basically. <laughs> um, but... I think being more focused on it, like using it as a packet or like even making your own version of fat fudge, like mixing it with some other things at home, having it on its own and then becoming more aware of its effect on your body. Like I really want people to be aware of what's happening to their body when they're eating something like that, especially if they're trying to discover the benefits of it. I love tahini as like uh, take a little bit of tahini and we've, we've had a lot of experts come on the podcast previously and talk about people having in their repertoire like um, a savory snack and not always sort of reaching for sweet mm -hmm. just to have as another option for them, especially when it comes to like metabolic health and other things if they're trying to like, you know, balance out their blood sugar and improve their results. So tahini is just one of those that you can quickly add in a bunch of little things like just even chopped vegetables, like a little bit of tahini, mix it all together, kind of make your own, I don't even know what that would be called, but like it's a salad. Salad. Yeah. <laughs> but with tahini, yeah. kind of the glue. Yeah. 
as holding it all together. I like that with tuna. I don't like mayo. I do not like mayo. I don't understand it. Every time I try to like it, my stomach turns a little bit, which is strange because I'm okay with aioli, but like mayo from the jar. So growing up, again, instead of mayo, tahini is in our tuna. So for me, tuna, tahini, a little lemon, a little little cumin, and then I'll put it in like a red bell pepper. And the, specifically red because I like the combination of the flavor of the red bell pepper in contrast to the tahini. And the tuna is a, a snack of mine. I love it. That's a recommendation for you right there. All right, let's go to the next one. Mushrooms, specifically like the medicinal mushrooms. So what are those and how do you incorporate them in what you have going on? There is a few of them. The ones that I use most commonly are cordyceps. Um, I'll use shiitake from a, a culinary perspective and chaga, turkey tail, um, reishi are the ones that I really like to use and they'll have different different benefits. Um, I For Sigmatic, um, Taro is a friend of mine, so he's introduced me to, to them a long time ago and got me incorporating them for, I have a pituitary adenoma, so I've been using um, them in higher dose combinations to help shrink that. And that's how I was introduced to them initially. And then before I introduced them to my clients, repertoire doing more research, like cordyceps I love using um, for endurance and performance enhancing um, altitude prep, uh, reishi, which is in the uh, adapt halva uh, fat fudge for regulating the nervous system, helping bring you down, chaga for the immune system, shiitake I love. It's just so powerful for gut um, healing. Do you have any favorites on your end? I feel like you're in the same boat when it comes to functional mushrooms. Yeah. You know, mushrooms is one of those in the category. Love taro, love what they're up to. I, for whatever reason, again, this is where everybody just pays attention to their own body. I don't feel a draw to them. That doesn't mean that I have a reaction to them, but yeah. I just don't feel a draw. I The culinary mushrooms, you know, that are there, I like to cook with them and include them in, especially I get them from the farmer's market here, good sources. Yeah, not what are all. your favorite mushrooms? Um, I love the... Um, the, what are they called? The trumpet mushrooms, yeah. like the really thick ones. Yeah. I like to kind of cut those up like little pieces of uh, almost like like little tiny pieces of steak yeah. in a way. <laughs> yeah. And I and I like to uh, pan fry them yeah. and uh, incorporate them with like a nice like omelet or something like that. Um, love shiitake mushrooms as well. You can make and, shiitake like a steak too. Get the really big heads, yep. score them as if you're scoring a steak and lightly uh, sear them with little coconut aminos. But- for longer than you think on a lower heat and it becomes really beefy mm. and the umami flavor on that because of the the coconut aminos is really nice. I, I will do something similar with lion's mane mushroom, which is this beautiful mushroom. It's like this cream color and I guess it looks a little hairy, but I'll do that slow like saute with that too. Yeah. The thing that I do really, really love is that anytime I get a whiff of like my tonsils are acting up or like my throat is starting to get a little inflamed. I am a huge fan of uh, the My Community spray by uh, Paul Stamos no, and his company. What's in it? Uh, it's got all the mushrooms, every one that you just mentioned yeah. over there, minus the culinary ones. Yeah. And it's an incredible blend. And I just find it works really well with me. No financial ties or anything to the company, but that's kind of been one of my go-tos. So you are drawn the, to it. I in not in the that's like when I get if I'm feeling like sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use it then. Yeah. yeah. It's not a thing that I use on a regular basis. I know there's fantastic product products that are there and yeah. I love them all. Like yeah. they all taste amazing. Yeah. Um but yeah. Yeah, I think I think before somebody goes down the path of all these all these ingredients maybe not liver because it's not very costly, but some of these ingredients like the functional mushrooms can be, you know, pricey for an average um, household. It's removing other inflammatory foods, doing the best you can with what you have first. So you can more easily notice if any of these other things are beneficial to you. Because sometimes people get really excited and like, okay, I'm going to buy everything they talked about, but like, do it in stages, like remove some other things first, get in a good place where you can actually be aware of how these things impact you in the same way that you're very aware that that spray helps you when you're feeling a little under the weather. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And the company's called Host Defense. Host Defense. Host Defense. Defense. Yeah. You've probably seen it around. And another note about that is that there is uh, one of the world's top cancer researchers and uh, his name is Ralph Moss. He was previously at Sloan Kettering and uh, 
through some controversies that he's talked about in this podcast previously, uh, he was asked to leave because he was questioning the efficacy around a drug that was being overhyped mm -hmm. and uh, was also touting, because they asked him to look into what are some of the natural things that are out there that in addition can work with pharmaceutical interventions. And he came back with a whole list. He was hoping to debunk the whole situation, came back with a whole list. And one of his items that he had on there was some of these medicinal mushrooms. And when my mom had got diagnosed with breast cancer, this was now almost like 12, 13 years ago, um, I reached out to him and I said, hey, you know, I'd love if you can do a little consult. He's kind of like the cancer CEO. He steps in and helps people like say, okay, you're going to need this type of doctor. You're going to work with this, get this test at this one place mm -hmm. and like all in the specialty of what that person's cancer is. Mm -hmm. And he brought in some evidence-based supplements and there was a few, again, I don't have the details in front of me of what he was referencing, what that evidence is, but I'll throw it in the show notes. He brought a few medicinal mushrooms that had shown some benefits for the particular type of cancer that my mom right, had. Right, right, right. Which I, was amazing Turkey too. Tell is one of my star ingredients for my pituitary adenoma. Mm. Named him Herbert. Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hopefully uh, you don't meet a real Herbert in, in real life. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because I it's, it had been shrinking, which was really cool. Just doing – my doctor and I have an agreement. He's like, I'm going to let you do what you do with food for a period of time. And if it shows that you are making progress with it, I will let you continue. And if you don't or it starts to grow again, then we'll go a different route. And he I, – I love that I do have a primary care physician who uh, knows that – what he does and what I do can work together. Like he'll call me for consults with his other patients. Be like, this is what I'm going to do from a medical standpoint. What do you recommend from a nutrition standpoint? Which is really cool for just a regular primary care physician. But it's I've seen some some progress with that. Let's go back to your story for a second. So you're mentioning when you were younger, you were throwing up, migraines, you know, fatigue that you were dealing with. There's a whole host of symptoms. So now, obviously, this is your lifestyle, the way you eat, the superfoods you include, and then just the general makeup of your base diet. Do you ever have what maybe somebody would call flare-ups now? If you do, what are the circumstances that you know contribute to them? Um, or has largely, because you've so radically changed, like, you just don't deal with these symptoms. Anymore. Yeah, I had a talk um, and and somebody in the audience said to me or asked, like, do you just basically feel good all the time now? And I took a deep breath and kneeled down. I was like, look, here's the thing. <laughs> I manage multiple clients. I have two businesses. I do too much. And just because I eat well doesn't mean I feel good all the time. But there's no way that I could do everything that I'm doing right now if I wasn't following the protocol I'm following right now. Like, heaven forbid, I was still in the place I was before. I wouldn't be able to get as much done as I can. So I don't feel great all the time. Um, we just had NBA playoffs. That's an insane schedule to follow. I'm definitely exhausted. I'm incorporating every tool that I have, my red light therapy in the morning, my Norma tech, making sure I'm fueling properly to sort of stay away from some of the flare-ups you might have as a result of limited sleep, stress, and just a crazy schedule. Um, for me, if I get something that's cross-contaminated as a celiac, I will have a flare-up. I'm having a flare-up right now from some cross-contamination last week. So I have brain fog. I have a rash on my elbows. Um, I have some inflammation in my face and my joints. I can't get my aura ring off. Um, and so I, I end up following closer to my gut reset to sort of calm everything down in that process, doing sauna, cold showers, things like that. Um, so for me, flare-ups have to do when I'm doing too much. And um, I, I always get a little frustrated. Like I wish I felt better so I could do more. I'm not the person that wants to do less. So learning how to be kind to myself, like take a time out as much as I can, depending on the schedule. Um, Cause it's not like I can be like, sorry, NBA, just, I'm flare up. I gotta go lay down. It's like, okay, I know that there's an end date when I can take some time for myself. Um, and just following a, a, as, as good of a diet as I possibly can. And, and knowing that this too shall pass. So I try not to get frustrated when I have a flare-up because this used to be my every single day. Mm. So when I have a flare-up now or a migraine now, I'm like, oh, I can't believe that this was normal for me. And I'm appreciative of you opening up and sharing about this because I think a lot of people can relate to it, especially people who have – maybe they didn't have the exact condition or circumstances of symptoms you had, but people have gone through stuff. And then you – change your lifestyle back to the way it was previously, or there's certain heavy stressors from work or 
the environment or people responding to sort of the latest happenings in the news yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And things can come back. Yeah. And I think that a big piece, which you hit on, is that mindset piece of being kind and not leaning into wanting to beat yourself up. When you do beat yourself up, what is the story that's circling in your head? You know, what's the story that you're telling yourself when you're trapped in that component? And again, all of us beat ourselves up. I'm just curious, what story do you tell yourself? Yeah. And 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 I want to be really clear too, you can be doing everything right in front of you and still be having a flare up. And that could be a trauma response. There's a, a I think a lot of people sort of push down any sort of experience they've had and be like, oh, it's in the past or it wasn't that big of a deal. And even not acknowledging that you've been through something, your body's going to hold on to that some way and that could create a cascade effect of an autoimmune response. And maybe we'll change what autoimmune response means in the future, but there is an emotional component to it as well. Um, you see a lot of autoimmune stuff with people who have PTSD. Um, and as far as your question of like beating myself up, um, I have to really think about that because I'm so solution forward. I mean, I have, I do have depression. I do wake up most days, not automatically in the best mood um, and being like, oh, another day. So I have to go through um, different habits and steps to feel better uh, and get back into what I think my true, ba I think my true baseline underneath whatever is causing the depression is optimism and generosity and joy. Otherwise, how can I get there by following some steps? So when I beat myself up, I don't actually talk down to myself. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any time that I did talk down to myself. I more so observe of like, okay, you're feeling this way. You have an understanding that it's not really your baseline. Things may feel very overwhelming. You may not want to deal with this. And I just sort of, I cocoon would be the worst version of it is I won't leave my apartment for a few days. Um, and the idea of going past my doorstep is very overwhelming. And I'm like, okay, I'm having a heightened response to something right now. Um, and again, being very patient with myself, practicing self-care. And self-care could sometimes be, for me, it's dairy-free, eating some ice cream and zoning out and watching a movie and just being very, very still. Um, but I don't, I don't talk down to myself. I really... I, I look at myself like the the five year old version of myself. You're not, an observer. Yeah, I'm not going to be mean to a five year old. Type That's of thing. great. I think that probably took a lot of practice. Or do you think that it was always that way? Just because you went through so much. Um, I think I've I've always been an observer from a young age. A very odd kid in the observations. Like I have memories that don't make sense. As far as my mom goes, how do you even remember that? You were maybe maybe a year old, maybe even eight months because we, we didn't live in that apartment when you were older. So I think I've always had this, this observational element. I've, I have definitely been through some very traumatic experiences, definitely have lost a lot of people in my life. Um, and I think when I wasn't aware of that, I would have like a hyper response, like a blow up. And I don't yell often, but I'll like start yelling about something or immediately need to leave a situation because I'm not aware of what's going on. I'm having like just a, a, a response to what's happening exactly in the moment, a reaction. And I had to spend a lot of time learning how to, okay, this is the trigger that's happening inside of me. It's up to me if I want to display that trigger in a certain action or a certain thing I say. And now observing it and being like, I may not always be in control of how I feel, but I am in control of what I do with that feeling. And that takes practice. And I'm 37 now, and I wouldn't say I've gotten really good at it until like 29, 30, 31. Um, and I still, I, I mean, I, I've maybe had one moment like that that lasted a few minutes in the last year. And even even in the moment, I'm like, oh, but you're about to have an episode. <laughs> <laughs> and ha I thought actually I, I could val I, for me I'm like rationalized like I deserve to have that episode but it lasted a few minutes and I catch it right away. Uh, are you for your autoimmune condition? How crucial? Just touching on it because there's a lot of people that because of our past topics of covering autoimmune because we've done it quite a bit with Terry, Doctor Rajdani, who's another great doctor down the street. We're getting an influx of people that are recently discovered that they have an autoimmune condition. Um, 
What do you want to say about autoimmune and sleep, especially with how much stuff is on your plate? Yeah, sleep is so crucial. That's the first thing I try to tackle uh, right after changing up the diets with my my clients is everyone gets an aura ring. I actually have a coach's view where I get to hit refresh and see what my clients are doing, which is kind of creepy. Like if I introduce a new supplement and I want to see how they slept, I'll just hit refresh in the morning. Like, oh, they're up. Let me send them a text. <laughs> they're like, no, no, no. We're good. We're just at the club right now hanging out. Hey, I do ask them to take their <laughs> ring off when they go out. I'm like, if you're going to party, I don't want to see what's happening. Just take the ring off. But sleep is so underrated. Um, I notice for my autoimmune, if I get my ideal is eight hours. If I get less than six, I will have a flare up. Mm. And it's not as intense as a cross contamination flare up, but it's like white noise in my brain, or I'm very sensitive or very anxious. And uh, something as simple as taking a 20 minute nap, trying to fit that in, will make a world of a difference if the schedule's insane and I just know that I'm not going to get good sleep for the next week type of thing. So, like, sleep. I don't, I don't think we could ever talk enough about sleep. Um, one of my other clients wrote a book on it. I'm trying to remember the name of it. But like Ariana talks, Huffington talks a lot about sleep. I think she was one of the first people that I recognized in, in that status touting sleep in that world of like glorifying how busy we are, glorifying how little sleep we get. So she was one of the first people in that industry that, that was like, well, I think we got it wrong. Well, I think I think what's beautiful now is that, especially with all these podcasts that are out there and people like yourself going on them, there's now almost like a reverse glorification of like, hey, I sleep this much and I get this much done, which right. is a beautiful thing to hear. Right. Because it's so key. You know, my wife doesn't have an autoimmune or anything else like that. But when she doesn't get even one night of not getting the right amount of sleep, we're more likely to have friction during the day, you know. I'm not putting that on her. There could be both sides, <laughs> right? There could be both sides. Girl, wait, 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 wait. Let me clarify. <laughs> um, just in case she listens to this episode, love you, baby. Uh, yeah, it's so key. It could literally be the sixth superfood on our list over here. I think I think that's before anything else. To be honest, I would one, move, two, and three. I would move it up. Yeah, definitely. Um, like, what do we need when we're sick? Sleep. What do we need when we're cranky? Sleep. It's it really will help create a clearer picture too of what's going on if you adjust sleep. I'm sure you work with, before we get to our last superfood and some other topics we want to cover, I'm sure you work with a lot of clients of all different dietary approaches, right? Like you mentioned you had worked with some athletes and did some work with Nike and those athletes were vegan or vegetarian. I'm asking primarily because you know that's the background that I came from. I don't eat that way now. Um, when you're helping people in that world who have just chosen for their own reasons, mm -hmm. could be cultural, mm -hmm. could be animal stuff that's there. Um, any things that beyond the obvious of, you know, people talk about B12 and they talk about, you know, a couple supplements you might need. Any things for the people that are committed that this is what I'm doing right now for these specific reasons, what, how do you modify and sort of have them? have some of the best of the world of paleo minus animal products, like reducing some of the grains, et cetera? Like what have you seen have been best practices? It's focusing on nutrient dense foods and leafy greens. Um, everyone gets collard greens, mustard greens, chard, different spices. But if someone comes to me and they're like, I want to be vegan, I want to do this vegan, I tell them you need to work with someone else. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be the solution for everyone. And I don't care to be the solution for everyone. If you're that dead set on it. Now, if we run blood work and it says it's great for you, we can work around that. But generally my response to someone who is like, I eat vegetarian, I eat vegan. And it's not for religious purposes. I, I do put the religious uh, requirements in a different class where we'll be more likely to, to work around that. Um, and again, keep in mind who I'm working with. I'm working with some of the elite performers across multiple industries. They usually want to feel their best to keep doing what they're doing. But if we run blood work and the blood work says you need something and it happens to only come from an animal, you're going to argue with blood work. It's not, I'm not imposing my belief system on you. I'm looking at what your body is telling us you need. And if your body, if you're a vegan and your body is saying we need to have these different foods in there and you just refuse to, 
I'm I'm not the best person to help you. There is probably someone who knows exactly how to optimize a vegan diet. And that person should get your business, not me. I'm not going to pretend like I'm going to become a perf- like the expert on vegan performance. You mentioned blood work. So when you're looking at markers, just again, from your perspective, you're part of a team, mm-hmm. right? You're part of a team and you're the first person to say like, look, I'm not the medical doctor. I'm the person who's enhancing through food yeah. performance and I work with medical doctors. Yeah. I think there. you used the, you were referring to someone as like the cancer CEO. Right. Like I, I think I'm in the performance CEO. There you go. Performance you know? CEO. Like I, I have learned a lot through experience over the last 10 years. So I'm very good at, at getting very close to figuring out what lever we need to pull. Um, but it's all done with a team. We've got functional medicine doctors, primary care. We've got different specialists. We've got sleep specialists. We've got PTs. Like it's a whole team that we're working together for that, that goal. Um, but would you think you're going to ask me a question about markers? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just some of the top markers that you're paying attention to that Um, are there, like just from your perspective, your approach. General comprehensive. I want to know how's your pituitary functioning. I want to see what your nutrient levels are like. Um, there are some, there are some people who don't believe in the, um, food sensitivity, the blood serum one. Um, I find that in organizations like sports organizations are like, Oh, that changes so frequently that we don't think the efficacy of it is very strong. And my pushback is always, you know, things do change in the body. So I want to see the food sensitivity because I want to give them the best possible, um, environment to reduce inflammation in their body. Um, and then after all the general labs, so glucose, all of those things, then it will drill down to, to things that are more specific depending on the client. Do you ever run, uh, do you ever run like omega quant and fatty acids and things like that? Uh, I do. And I don't know enough to, to speak on them. So I usually let the doctor tell me what, like, okay, this is what we're seeing. Um, this is what I would like to see. This is how the conversation goes. Doctor goes, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'd like to see shift. Here's the nutrients or the organs or whatever is being affected. And then they don't know what to do after that because they don't usually know a lot about diet and nutrition. I go, cool. I'll then take that information, start doing heavy research on uh, mechanisms and pathways and, okay, what affects this? Now, what foods can affect this? Then come up with a list of things I think will work and what the dose is. Go back to the doctor. We'll look at it together. Then I'll go to like uh, – Dan Garner and Andy Galpin, they're, they're sports chemists and sports scientists. They'll they'll go over the work that I did, present something new, or say it looks good, and then we'll come up with a plan. Like it, it is really a team of just everyone sort of specializing in their lane, but then also hopping into each other's lane. So there's no egos about it. That's great, which is how things should be approached. And one day, I'm very bullish on technology. I've made a lot of investments in the space of – you know, technology being a part of this, ultimately what you've created, which is again, for people that are at the top of the top, um, that is not going to be able to scale. You right. know, we're never going to have enough doctors. There's barely any functional medicine doctors when right. you look at the world of it. So and then very, good ones on top of that. Good ones on top of that. <laughs> There's a lot of ones that are out there that again, maybe well-intentioned, maybe not well-intentioned, but there may be, you know, some, many are doing their best, but it's just, it's a systems thing, right? It's a systems Agree. thing. So I can't wait for more technological interventions that can help do the heavy lifting so that more of this can scale to more people. I think there's more than one perspective too. Like, yes, the systems to be able to scale this for more people, but then also the other system that creates these problems in the first place, our food sourcing, uh, our accessibility in certain parts of the world and different parts of neighborhoods in America specifically. So it's like, yeah, we. it's great to have systems that allow people to have access to the information that I give my clients in the process, but also how do we impact how we get our food? If you could wave a magic wand and there was just like one component of that that you could get a chance to address for- What a, what a simplistic question. Let's do it. There's somebody listening here yeah. and they're working in something and they might have the ability to pull on that lever. If there was one component that you could I, wave a magic it's wand so, on. It's so complicated. Like it's agriculture, the way we process food. It's it's super complicated. I think accessibility, It start, right now it starts with the sex accessibility, especially in the underserved communities where they don't even have access to whole foods on a regular basis. There's, um, I think it's, I think it's Misfit Market. 
uh, and supermarkets spelled in an interesting way where they get access to those communities to um, like farmer market type fruits and vegetables and education to back that up. Because if the consumer makes better choices then the, those who are providing the consumers need to make changes. Um, I know there's big efforts all the way up to like the government level. Um, Cory Booker is doing some work around changing all of that. I think it's a very uh, courageous effort that will take a lot of time. But I don't I don't know that I think there is one magic wand uh, answer. I mean, do you, do, are you sitting on an answer for us? That <laughs> Not that I was asking you for an answer for the whole thing. But if there was one thing that you could change that you thought from your perspective of the world that yeah. would have the biggest. And I think you gave an answer. You said underserved communities that don't have access to both the combination of food and you added in, I think is an important missing piece that people leave out is the education, is the education combined with the food. And sometimes it's even just basic cooking classes. There's a project that was done at Cleveland Clinic um, for their Center for Functional Medicine where, you know, they were writing essentially like, you know, giving out and working with a local provider to have the food available to some of these underserved groups. But then there was a question of like, well, what do we turn this into? And this feels like a lot of work and how do we make this happen? So it has to be combined with some basic cooking classes, how to also uh, make those localized for the flavors that those communities, depending on what part of the country you might be in, actually want to enjoy. You know, how crazy are we to think that our version of eating healthy should be imposed on that same, sure. you know, population sure. that might have a different sort of uh, flavor profile in what they enjoy. So yeah, I think you answered it. Yeah, I think definitely more programs in, in schools too. I think if you empower kids in that way, agency over what they put on their body and agency over like I can cook something, it cascades far beyond just nutrition and wellness, but the sense of pride and self worth and self-confidence that in sports i think every kid should learn how to cook and play sports <laughs> let's touch on our last superfood that we tossed in right before this interview started and that's I forget saffron. Already. saffron yes 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 yeah what do you want to say about saffron i um i want you to share what you found first <laughs> well yeah i linked to this in a newsletter that i had uh, written previously and it's an article by the atlantic that i came across um a while ago, and it's called The Spice That Hooked Medieval <laughs> Nuns. And the subtitle is Saffron Has Been Altering People's Moods for Hundreds of Years. And basically, the story goes into how saffron was discovered by these nuns during medieval times in Europe who found out that saffron had almost like uh, an effect where they felt euphoric, mm -hmm. a little high, and it would work so well that it became a regular part of this routine. And then the church got a little worried about this and at times was even considering like, should this be banned? Should this not no be allowed? No fun in the church. <laughs> you can't, you know, I don't know if we want everybody to be feeling good all the time. Uh, How can we shame bad. them if they feel good all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to put your email out for anybody that has complaints? <laughs> we can direct it. Uh, if you want to send you. me an email with a complaint, go ahead and I will let you know or recommend that you should see a therapist as to why you are so easily offended <laughs> by chef other people. Chef at paleochef.com. Uh, um, yeah. So what do you want to add on top of that for saffron? So saffron I use for my athletes for, um, for mood boosting, for sure, for altitude uh, training um, for just blood oxygen levels. Um, it also has some antiviral effects and it's really, really powerful. It is one one of, if not the most expensive spice in the world, but it's also incredibly, incredibly potent. So it just takes a pinch of those threads and I like to let it seep in a tea or put it in like a cold pressed juice with uh, turnip juice and celery juice and um, some coconut oil and let it turn. And that's part of like a, a daily supplement, but it, it has very, it has very noticeable effects. Um, again, my clients, the athletes at least are on a very strict protocol all season. So they notice effects of things very easily. And so one of my athletes is really good at noticing when it's included and noticing when it's not included. Like say I forgot the saffron for a couple of days. He's like, something was off with that tonic. Like I didn't feel like the normal boost. And I'm like, motherfucker, how did you notice that was missing? Mary, we <laughs> lost yesterday. I don't think you put your <laughs> saffron in my green juice. <laughs> I definitely got accused of, 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 or there was one game I couldn't make. Um, 
And there was a game prior to that I couldn't make and they had lost both games. And I got like four or five text messages from different people on the staff like, we put this on you. And I'm like, right, this is my fault. (laughs) You have to come to the games. (laughs) So what you're saying is that if somebody is into sports betting, they should follow you on Instagram to find out when you're not showing up. Uh, Yeah. Although this is actually, I, I... I only took the word of the chef. Uh, we were um, we were at an away game, and when we're at away games, I have I have access to the hotel kitchen, so I can do my thing for my athletes. I don't work with whole teams; I work with specific athletes on the teams, and I travel with all of our meals for the away games. And so I was in the kitchen at an away game, and the chef there goes, "Fat fudge, I know fat fudge. So and so team uses this fat fudge," and I'm like, "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, the whole team uses it. it was in our kitchen." And I'm like, are you sure it's this product? He's like, yeah. I go, this is my product. He's like, that's really cool. You didn't know they use it. I was like, no. Business me is stoked. Loyal to my soil me is like, I got to look up who is buying this and turn off their subscription for the rest of the season. (laughs) I'm not trying to help these fools. I didn't do that. P.S. Just for the record. But I had this like, this is so cool. And I do believe in what I do so much that I do think it could help a whole team. You didn't do that, but you want everybody to know that you could do that. I could that. have. Just I was so, like, who's ordering this? <laughs> just so anybody tries to cross you and break your trust, you they need to know what you're capable of. Uh, I would never do anything like that, although it's very entertaining to, to say out loud. To imagine. I hope people have a sense of humor. I really do. Yeah, yeah. No, our audience definitely has a sense of humor. Um, talk about the product suite that you have that it's available for people. We've already mentioned Fat Fudge. That's yep. the main... That's the main seller, yeah. the best yeah, yeah. seller. Yeah, yeah. That's so out there. we have three different versions. The cacao original has been there since the get. This last year, I launched the Power Berry, which is um, it's got beets, cordyceps, and then berry in there. It tastes more like strawberry. So if you're someone who doesn't like berry, I've been told people like I wasn't expecting to like it, but that's energy without caffeine. And then the Adopt Halva, which some people say it tastes like a fluffer nutter. That. That uh, peanut butter marshmallow sandwich kids would have. Never had that before. Um, I think I think it's an American thing. Um, and this one has reishi and ashwagandha, so it's meant to like chill you out. Um, I did some powders for a short period of time to test the market, some sleep tonics, which did well. So we'll be bringing that back, and then keep your eyes peeled for the black seed oil supplement, and then almost anything you see me post for my athletes is coming down the pipeline. I mean, you know that I almost lost the business a couple of years ago from yeah. a manufacturing nightmare. Is and- there, is there, can I just interrupt for a second? Yeah, of course. Just because like, you know, we're always thinking about audience value. What do you think translatable to the audience? Any person who's going through a tough time, it doesn't have to be somebody who owns a business. Yeah. It doesn't have to be somebody who's in the health world specifically, but what were some of the key lessons and takeaways that you took away during that time that could be applicable to anybody that's going through a tough tough time, even if it's one or two? Um, Even if it's not your fault, there's a way to make it your responsibility. Mm. Um, You don't have to fix it right away. Be patient in that process. And this too shall pass. Yeah. The first one is really powerful. I've shared on the podcast before that one of my favorite quotes from this executive coach who was previously a venture capitalist, his name is uh, Jerry Colonna. Um, he asked this quote, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't have it in front of me. He says, um, how have I been complicit in the things that I say I don't want in my life? So even if it's not your fault, how have you been complicit? How did you play a part in the story, in the development? Even if that is, sometimes, we've all done this before, letting people treat us a particular way and maybe not speaking up early. Okay, great. We just did the best that we could, but we participated in it because the law of responsibility says that if it's not your fault at all, at all whatsoever, and again, minus, you know, we're obviously having a carve out so everybody understands there's always exceptions to the rule. You know, <laughs> sexual violence, sure. you know, other things, you know, th- that stuff exists in the world. There are crazy people. There are, you know, terrible people in the world. But we're talking about the day-to-day that most people experience. If it's not in some way your fault, then it's very unlikely that you could do something to rectify it. But on the flip side, the lo- law of responsibility says that if in some way this is my fault, that means I can at least do something to influence it, which is a reminder about the power that we have. We're supremely powerful. I don't, I think. 
I think what I do with food is just a tool. And the bigger message is for people to understand how powerful they are when they can feel good. Most people don't know they can feel good. And if I, and I think this has to do with my keen sense of mortality, because most of the people in my life I care about have passed away even at young ages, is um, I want them to get the most out of life, whatever that version for them looks like. And it's hard to make decisions to get there if you don't feel good. So one way to start feeling good is diet, nutrition, wellness, and then you start making decisions from that place. The number of readers who I think they're so brave. They're like, I changed the way I ate or incorporated this thing that that you recommended and I wasn't in pain and I quit my job and I did this. And it's like, that's really powerful that you not being in pain allowed you to see there's a different path in my life that I want. Feeling good is the unlock to so many other aspects of our lives that we also want to change. And on the flip side, just as you shared before, you can be doing everything right and life happens. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, it's when we have these mantras that remind us that this is just a moment in time. As you said, this too shall pass. Yeah. I th I think I learn a lot from sports. The, the greatest are motivated and fueled by failures. They don't get knocked down and be like, well, that's it. No, they're like, okay, I'm going to improve and get better. Um, and I think any one of life, any of those moments where life happens, it's an opportunity for you to really show how powerful you are. Make meaning out of it. Not a, I don't believe everything happens for a reason, but I do believe you can make meaning out of it and write a story that's profoundly powerful and also inspiring because I think we're all influencers day to day. Even something as simple as being the first to smile in an elevator, that could influence that person that you smiled at to then pass that forward. Beautiful. I love it. Mary, where can the people follow you? And do you have like, you know, one thing that I see that my audience really loves is like you're talking about these ingredient spotlights and other stuff like the latest research, like new ingredients, new things. Is there, of course, social media, we'll link to that, Paleo Chef. Is there a newsletter or some version where people can get pushed to them or do they get notified some way when you have some new God, insight? I should create one. <laughs> come on now. Just a synthesis. I'm the worst. Like I have I have a very large email list that I don't email. Because you know, we can't I'm leave it up to Instagram. They're always <laughs> changing can. the algorithm. Yeah, that's why and you proactively check your favorite feeds. We're here. All right. Yelling okay. into the abyss. But I do, I mean, I do have a newsletter that I'll be paying more attention to now that the the season's over. Um, and again, almost lost the business, decided to to self-fund the debt that was created from a, a manufacturing oversight. Um, and now that things are in such a great place again, being able to build out the systems that were beginning to get built out at that time. So it's having a regular newsletter, building out my team, which I'm, I feel so honored and lucky and privileged to be able to support a team. Um, going so on podcasts more frequently, going on podcasts more frequently, not feeling silly about it. Um, but paleochef.com is where you can sign up for this forthcoming regular newsletter. I do email you guys that just, you know, could be better, could be better at doing it more regularly. And then the paleo chef uh, feed is where I post the spotlights and also what I'm doing with my athletes and what I'm up to both from an entrepreneur standpoint and a chef standpoint and some mindset stuff and music. I post a lot of music. Um, and then fat fudge, a P H A T fudge, uh, dot com for the product. And the Instagram feed is fat fudge as well. Love it. TikTok. <sighs> I'm giving you guys My a to-do list. My team is right behind me. I'm giving you guys a to-do list. No, they love this because <laughs> they, they will, they will send me messages like great post on Instagram. You could turn that into a TikTok, you know? There you go. Are you on TikTok? I am. Yep. Regular, like on it? Yeah, I post probably about once Damn a day. It. Just mostly clips from this podcast. Okay. And it's amazing. I went from like zero to 20,000 in like just a few weeks. So you're recycling content from here or are you doing yeah. like live, like talking to it? No, I take the best clips from the people that I have, yeah. the pleasure of interviewing like yourself. I'll try to find something that gets people excited about wanting to listen to the interview. And it's been working amazingly. It's yeah. Working amazingly. A lot of people have seen a lot of success with that. Uh, Bobby Brown. Um, yep. She crushes it on there. And she talks about how she's a dim different demographic than you would assume is on TikTok, but they're on there. And she does more with the casual. She's like, I just go on there and talk. And then we're selling out a product like mad. And she's like, Mary, 
we're selling out like and I'm like, okay, I got it, I got it, got it. <laughs> All right, well, we'll stay tuned. Who knows? I, I do have an account. It's Paleo Chef on okay, there. Okay. <laughs> hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. When you give that medication, something like Viagra or Cialis or whatever it is, you are missing an incredible opportunity to help this person understand their fundamental health so much better.